Welcome, everyone. So lovely to see all of our old friends, new friends for the first time in four years. I'm very honored to be here to share with you all today and have been invited. So thank you so much to the committee for asking to ask me, me to come. So I know I don't have pink hair anymore, so maybe people don't remember who I am, but I'm still the same person. <laughs> if you don't know me, I will do a quick little introduction of myself and where I came from. I got into the games industry about nine years ago uh, when I co-founded an indie studio, uh, Octothorpe Games in Salt Lake City. It was my first entry into the games industry, uh, as well as where I started building my games user research expertise in an indie setting. Um, I was often seen toting my mobile lab around <laughs> campus in between classes to be able to do pop-up user testing during lunch when I was in university. <laughs> In 2017, I joined Ubisoft Montreal and became the embedded user researcher on Rainbow Six Siege production team. I spent about three years on Siege before I had the opportunity to become a user research lead. So at that point, I led a team of 13 researchers across all of our major brands and projects within Montreal. After about a little while after that, <laughs> skipping ahead to today, I'm now the director of insights. Um, I was the team leading the team in Montreal before we merged and actually became a Canadian entity with our Toronto and Quebec and Montreal teams. So that's enough about me. <laughs> Let's get into what I really wanted to talk to you all about today. So I'm happy to be here in person with you all. Obviously I've missed so many of you. It's great to meet so many new people and to be able to have a hybrid event where so many of us are coming together today and to learn best practices, new methods, and learn about trends in our field. We're here to work together in an effort to learn how we can improve our craft, which is phenomenal that we have such a strong community to do that. When Luke and Triskel first told me what the theme was for this year, I was very excited because community does play a huge role as to why we're here, as well as how many of us got to where we are today. So not only is the summit a place for learning, uh, but at its core, it's about community. We're building and fostering our community here today and all around the globe, <laughs> as well as all around shared goals. So we're sharing, teaching, learning, building our network, asking for help, offering help, making friends, or even looking for a new job. When I think about community, I think about our greatest opportunities moving forward as games user researchers. A place where we can find impact and influence to provide greater benefit for our players. And guess what? <laughs> it doesn't require any player recruitment no advanced research methodologies or reports. It's low cost, high reward, and doesn't matter whether you're a team of one or a team of 25 or more. Because it's all about conversations. And specifically, conversations with our partners and building an insights community. Let's start, before we start talking about conversations, let's take a look at our current reality, working as games user researchers and how we can improve on our current conversations. Our current reality looks a little something like this. Here we are in the middle. On the one side, we have our external audience, our players. On the other side, we have our internal audience, which is our stakeholders of various forms. This makes our position as researchers complex and very unique because we're positioned between these two groups. We sit in the middle of a pipeline of information, giving us highly valuable expertise on how our players consume games, what they do or do not understand, what they like or what they don't like, allowing us to advocate on their behalf to our stakeholders. Given our positioning, the question now becomes, how does our role function in between these two groups? Well, how things usually go is this. Uh, the volume of conversations we're having with our players far exceeds the volume of conversations we're having with our stakeholders. Our primary focus lies on the player. Our research becomes one direction. 
externally to our players and providing the output of those conversations to our stakeholders. With this situation, we have little conversations with our internal group, unless it revolves around the conversations we're having directly with our players. So even while this is the reality for many of us, this is not how this should look. <laughs> we should not be spending a disproportionate amount of time focused on only conversations with our players. Who we should be spending more time having conversations and researching is our stakeholders, our internal group. This group of internal stakeholders comprises a large portion of what our insights community is. They're the various stakeholders who cre we create insights for, as well as our internal partners who are also focused on players. Our insights community are our primary users. They rely on the output of our work and our expertise to make the best decisions. We're creating our insights for them. So what if we spent more time researching and building this audience, our users? Leveraging this group is where we level up. It's where our expertise is wholly realized because our value is not primarily held in the test room. Spending more time understanding the various people within our insights community means you can spend less time running research and more time influencing decisions. And if I'm losing you here because you say to me, Lainey, I am a researcher, I research players. Let's just call it field research. <laughs> Insert laughs. <laughs> My job is a researcher. I research players. Research is where I feel the most comfortable. This is my education background, right? The thing is, you won't approach your conversations with your stakeholders any differently than you will with your players. What you're still trying to do is figure out their needs, understand their experience. It's the same interview process we have with our players. So how do we identify your insights community? Depending on the size of your project or the teams you're working with, identifying them could take time. But you can start making small steps right away. And there's two primary strategies that you can use for this. First, start observing. Just start observing the projects and the teams that you're working with. Who are the ones making decisions? Who do those people consult for key information? What type of information are they looking for? And are they currently finding it? What is the process for decision making? It's important to note the goal here is not to understand the specifics of the decisions. It's to understand who's making decisions, where that's happening, and what the process is. This allows you to be able to start to understand, to figure out where your expertise can supplement this process. The second strategy of identifying your community, start looking for the folks in your organization who are also focused on players. They may be adjacent to your team in some way or within your organization somewhere else. These are the people who are also talking directly with players or utilizing the data from them. The goal with identifying these folks is to start finding your allies. As we work through the different strategies to identify our insights community, you'll find that this group is gonna take various shapes and sizes, which will depend on whether you're an embedded researcher, you're central, or you work externally from the development team. Whether your community is a couple of people or spans multiple offices and time zones isn't what's important. It's about identifying the two primary roles and the primary facets of those individuals that make up your group. First, your partners in creating and generating insights. Your second facet is the audience of your insights. Let's first talk about our partners in creating insights. These are the folks at your company who are also focused on players. 
They may be talking with them directly. They may be gathering and analyzing data about them, what have you. This can include people in community management. It can include market insights, analytics, or marketing. When we think about who to be included in our partners in creating insights, don't forget about any of the people in your organization who are talking to players directly through workshops, surveys, or social media. All of these partners are highly valuable assets to our group. By working with these folks, you can elevate the impact of your insights. Because after all, insights are more effective and fun with friends. <laughs> the second facet of our group is the audience of our insights. This group can include a wide variety of individuals and teams, and it's largely going to depend on your organization. This can include designers, directors, producers, and executives. I wanna point out, I am simplifying, very much simplifying things here, because the audience of your insights can be quite substantial. It can also be only a few people. You might also find that you have a lot of people in your group that are not included in this list. Ultimately, the audience of your insights can be anyone within your organization consuming and utilizing your deliverables and your expertise. So this includes anyone in creative roles, design roles, or business roles. It's also important to remember here that the facets of our community are not mutually exclusive groups. Our audience can be our partners, and our partners in creating insights can also be the audience of our insights. What's important is we spend time talking with these folks to understand how we can best leverage our expertise to ensure the best decisions are being made. Identifying our community by observing who's making decisions, when those decisions are being made, and where those conversations are happening can be part of the easy part here. <laughs> Success takes multiple steps. And it's important that you cannot rush or skip them. First, we have to build trust. This means taking time to understand the needs of your partners and identifying opportunities to provide insights that are timely and relevant. This is often the largest hurdle for us to get over. And it is the one that's going to take the most time. It can be challenging to build trust when our backgrounds and knowledge place such high importance on methods. But this will not always translate into building trust. More often than not, listening will be your greatest asset to building trust. Second, we need to build influence. Success here looks like guiding and accompanying your partners to utilize your insights to make the best decision for the player. Our last step of success is impact. If you've completed all the other steps, you'll reach this point. Success here looks like your expertise are the insights. You'll maximize your impact when your expertise is forming design decisions without the need to produce native research, to anticipate the needs of your partners. As we work through the steps of success, a key component we can't forget is credibility and how that will impact our success. Credibility is the fuel that pushes things forward. And more importantly, Credibility is the currency of our influence. Without it, there's nothing. What is often the most difficult for researchers is accepting that handing over a deliverable does not always equal credibility. Credibility takes time. You build it by having conversations with your partners to understand their realities and ensuring you're asking the right questions to allow you to provide the most relevant insights. It's vital that we take the time to understand their problems because presenting information that isn't helpful or isn't relevant erodes trust and credibility. Just like our methods won't default to building credibility, rarely are we losing credibility because of our methods. Credibility isn't always built with bringing something to the table. Sometimes it's just as about as much as asking the right questions to help getting conversations going. So how do we achieve this? 
How do we achieve having more conversations with our stakeholders? We know this is the situation that we want to build, but how do we start leveraging conversations to build it? Now that you've identified the folks that should be part of your community, the good news is, go do user research. <laughs> you already know how to do this. You know how to interview with your players. Use the same approach. Go start asking questions. Seek understandings of their motivations, their intentions, expectations, and goals. Instead of asking them what they need, ask them what problem they're trying to solve. Take time to understand their reality. What's possible, and even more important, what is not possible? Take time to understand those limitations and how they will impact how you deliver your insights in the future. Take time to learn game design. Learn the terminology. Take the time to discover how you can leverage that terminology into your research terminology. Set up interviews, grab a virtual coffee, read internal wikis, go to play sessions, participate in play sessions. Go see and be seen. And why should we do all of this? Creating our insights community and understanding their needs allows us to be better partners to help anticipate their challenges. Games are large and vast systems and complexities that given our time and resources, we'll never be able to fully test. We all know this reality. <laughs> But because of our knowledge and expertise, we are the most well-equipped to identify potential issues to the player experience and anticipate where there may be unintended friction or where the design may be breaking down. When we can provide insights to help illustrate the so what or the why for our partners, why they should care about this and they'll be, how they'll be able to use this information, we can ensure that we are sharing the most relevant insights exactly when it counts and avoiding giving information that isn't necessary. Building on past research and designing our research to help identify and anticipate challenges is vital. And it's also how we grow in our expertise. The evolution of our role is, lies in developing these partnerships because our primary function and value as researchers is not to be pointing out the problems, presenting issues, or delivering reports and waiting to hear back about the change. This means we're moving beyond solely being seen as a service provider and moving into being seen as partners, where we can provide valuable insights to anticipate those challenges that may impact the player experience. But even when we're anticipating challenges, or identifying issues, our goal isn't always to come with the solution. Our expertise lies in creating the space for decision making. Supporting decision makers in solving problems by giving them the confidence they're making the right decision for the benefit of the player. Because of our expertise, we can provide that unique perspective on the problems as well as anticipate the larger issues that might arise in the future. This allows our decision makers to be informed throughout the decision making process, which in turn can lower risks. Moving away from simply identifying issues with the player experience builds credibility. Leveraging our credibility and expertise allows us to be influential. Our end goal is to drive influence and impact with our partners for the benefit of the player, together. I want to take the opportunity to share quickly my own personal experience in building an insights community way back when as a research analyst on Rainbow Six Siege. I first joined the R6 team early 2018. I think it's very important to emphasize to you how little I knew about this game. <laughs> I had maybe five hours <laughs> in the game, and the production was three years post-launch. So there was a lot for me to get caught up on. Additionally, this project had been running for nearly three years with very little to no user research support. So not only were we in the process of building a research team, but we had a lot of catching up to do. The first step was taking the time to really get to know our stakeholders and partners. I'll add I wasn't alone in this. 
I was joining two other researchers who had just been working on the project just ahead of me. So we were able to divide and conquer some of these tasks and getting to know our stakeholders. So this meant it took us several weeks, <laughs> as opposed to months, um, to have a pretty good idea about who the decision makers were and the people that were key people on the project. We could now move from getting to know the people to spending our time listening and observing what they were trying to do. What was important here is that we weren't trying to answer people's questions. We weren't trying to bring research. We weren't bringing deliverables into those meetings. We were simply trying to spend time with our partners to listen and observe in an effort to understand the realities of the project as well as just trying to tend, spend time with the partners to be able to understand those bigger picture problems they were trying to solve. In those first few months, we did very little research. <laughs> we actually spent most of our time attending design meetings, play, going to play sessions, participating in play sessions, and generally just trying to meet everyone to understand their roles and what they were trying to achieve. Moving into this next phase was when we really started to build our momentum. By, time, by the time we reached the phase of focusing on the upcoming challenges, we were already solidifying our mindset and approach to how we wanted to work with the team. We decided to look into the future, not necessarily into a crystal ball, but just into the roadmap, about where we could have the most impact and support from the decision makers in the future. We wanted to showcase the full potential of our value and we knew things several months to a year down the line, we could accompany our partners at the earliest stages and highlights our capabilities at that time. The research we ran was largely focused on very early in conception, or at least early enough that the team could take hard pivots depending on the feedback that we provided. We spent considerable time building relationships with our partners in Insights, collaborating with them to broaden our reach as well as build the connections with the teams they work with and knew well. Our focus was paying off as we helped support our partners in a mindset of solving problems as one team, not just raising flags at the last minute or focusing on emergency needs or strictly validating. After nearly a year and a half on the project, I reached the final boss of building an insights community. I and others on the team, we were frequently called upon by the key decision makers to attend strategic meetings, to be able to provide guidance. Not only had we reached that table, but we did so by being invited for our entire expertise, not just the individual deliverables we could provide. Our partners understood our value, not because we explained it to them, but because we showed them. We did this by showing up when it counted most, listening, and helping to create space for decision making and supporting them in times when difficult decisions had to be made. We succeeded in building trust over time and that paid off in being able to be highly influential with decision makers and leading to significant impact for our team and our players. Building your insights community takes time, but it's something that with small steps can build an impact over time and I know this firsthand. First, Start identifying the key facets of the people and roles that comprise your community. Remember to look both at your partners in creating insights and your audience. The second step, which is the step we should all be most comfortable with, <laughs> is go out and do user research. With the individuals that you've identified, spend time talking with them to understand their realities. What problems are they trying to solve? Third, make sure to prioritize building credibility within, within your community. And remember, it takes time. And showing up with research isn't the best and only way. Last, once you've built key relationships within your community, you'll be well positioned to make better games with your partners, ensuring the best experience possible for your players. Remember, Doing research is the tool of delivering the insight, not the insight itself. This means many of our greatest opportunities don't revolve around a deliverable at all. Despite what it may appear, we don't work with production teams to solely run user tests. 
We're here to identify a mismatch between the player experience and the design. We're here to better anticipate challenges and reduce the risk. We're here to help create the space for informed decision making to occur. Don't let the deliverable define the end of your expertise. And it doesn't all end here. Over the next two days, you're gonna be learning about a variety of topics and hearing from many experts. You'll learn about new approaches to leverage your expertise, new frameworks and methods to apply, advice and learnings from many of the top professionals within our community. My challenge to you is to take these tools and learnings as you go back to work with your teams and use them as the starting point, not the end. Leverage your knowledge to be better partners and to expand the impact of your expertise through the conversations you can have. And remember, methods and research of players are a fraction of our capabilities. So let's all go build our own research community. Thank you all so much. <laughs>Thank you so much for the committee for inviting me. Uh, thanks for all the folks that I spoke with in preparing for this topic. If you wanna hear more from me, you can find me on the GER Cafe podcast. Thank you very much.